Ah. Ah. I think people can hear you. All right. I'm okay. just, I'm no, 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 no. You can leave that one too. All right. It's, it's going to pick you up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Just talk. That's all. <laughs> Good afternoon, welcome to Left Forum 2018. And uh, this panel is called Jazz and Self-Determination of Social History. And um, Althea Sully Cole and myself are moderating this panel. We just did a set of music. I appreciate it to, uh, to Althea once again and for being here and to, to you for coming. Uh, I'm moderating quote unquote but I, this is an opportunity to um, for a student to have a public discussion with the people that he learned from uh, which I most certainly did and still do so uh, and I appreciate this constant learning experience and I felt that this was important to do because a lot of the independent activity that was happening within jazz is a parallel dynamic with social movements in general. In fact, uh, the lives of the people who play the music are not any different from the lives of the people themselves. And uh, all the environmental factors that affect our everyday life. Professor Bassam Chawe. Yeah, I'm going to end um, <coughs> Professor, organizer uh, at Hat Hub Records and at Bassett College, and is a great musician who has a lot of experience with a lot of independent activities as well. And this is great maestro, Joe McPhee. <laughs> and our esteemed professor, Mr. Warren Smith. Westbury, which uh, was the genesis for the careers of a lot of musicians that we know now who attended that school, like Craig Harris, and um, I believe Mr. Smith and Ken McIntyre started that program That's right. together. Uh, Mr. Smith also was the founder proprietor of the Studio WIS in New York City on 21st and 7th Avenue. Uh, Mr. Nchawe was deeply involved with the East Cultural Center and black news. <laughs> and so, um, do you want to start off? I know you have a presentation. Well, I got a, yeah, I got a yeah. little multimedia thing That's to great do, thing, whatever so. else it is. So, you know, we can go ahead and do that. Um, Am I blocking anybody's view? Oh. Okay. Turn the lights out so everybody will be able to see this. Um, <coughs> Peace, everybody. Good to be here. Um, it's important that we talk about culture in the context of an event like this. Because too often, culture is not treated with the respect that it should be, understanding the importance of what culture actually is and what it does. President Ahmed Sekutori of Guinea once said, revolution is first an act of culture. Mm. And it is. Now, in preparing for this, which I guess my whole life has been preparation for going ahead and doing this, you know, what I'm doing today, uh, I looked at a book called The Freedom Principle. And this was Freedom Principle Jazz after 1958 by somebody named John Litweiler. And Litweiler makes the argument that the freedom and liberation that happened in terms of our music from 1958 until, well, I can't say the present, but let's say through the 1970s into the early 80s, was an attempt to actually make the music free to actually break down many of the, what he saw as being structural impediments and conventions in regards to music. But that's not the case. That African music has always been created by people to free the African mind, free the African body, 
and free the African spirit. And that once we understand that, then we can go ahead and put our music into another kind of context and see what it actually does in regards to our lives. I'm the only person presenting here who's not a musician. But I have to say, as uh, those of us who are activists, when we talk about the autobiography of Malcolm X, we say, well, I read that book and it transformed my life. In some instances, we say, it saved my life. In terms of music, my involvement in the music has transformed my life. And I have to probably say, it saved my life as well. That I'm just a homeboy from the projects. Grew up in Throgs Neck Project in the Bronx. All right, but, you know, was able, based upon a number of things to happen, that happened to me, happened for me, you know, was able to transform myself so that, you know, I still have comrades who are back in the project that I grew up in. But I'm not there anymore. Now, this idea, you know, in terms of culture and what it should do and where it should actually be placed when we start talking about things that we talk about in the left forum is, I, I think, very, very critically important, as I said earlier. And it's important that for the future, you know, we elevate culture, performance, this revolutionary music, and present it in the fashion that it needs to be presented in, in a forum like this. Now, Papa Lou Donaldson, I'm going to start here. Papa Lou Donaldson, Lou Donaldson, people familiar with Papa Lou? How many people familiar with Papa Lou? Papa Lou is now 91 years old, uh, famous, important alto saxophonist, as I say, <laughs> and a neighbor of mine. He used to live in Throg's Neck Project. And about four or five years ago, I was walking into the corner store where I live now in the North Bronx. And who do I see? I see Papa Lou. And I say, like, Papa Lou, what's happening? What's going on? Anyway, you know, he's a neighbor of mine. He lives a block away from me. And I saw him about a week ago, and he was sitting down over across the street because he goes, he takes uh, a daily walk, you know, down the block, down my block, and he was resting. And, you know, we started conversing. And we were talking about music. He was talking about the fact that uh, he's written a book and nobody will publish it because he's telling the truth. And one of the things he said, is he said that John Coltrane chased the people away from the music. <clears throat> and, you know, at the time, you know, I'm, I wasn't going to argue with Papa Lou because, you know, he's 91 years old. <laughs> All right? But there are people who actually believe that based upon the way the music has developed, and we have to understand that the music is not developed in a vacuum. That the music has actually developed, when we start talking about this revolutionary free music, it happened at a time when people politically and culturally were talking about revolution. So it's only natural that this would happen. If we look back in time, bebop, Bebop developed in regards to looking at what was taking place as far as African people around the time of World War II and right after. And if we understand what has happened to African people here in America, we understand that at that particular point, that is essentially the birth of what many people refer to as the Civil Rights Movement. Some of us see it as the continuum of the African liberation movement. Because that's a movement that started when African people were first brought here, and it continues to this day. Earlier, we can see that during the Harlem Renaissance, which was a political, cultural movement, we can look at the Garvey movement in Harlem. We can look at the culture that people were creating, writing in regards to the Harlem Renaissance. And musically, what was going on? We had Duke Ellington creating not just a dance music, but an art music, which began to address the conditions of African people at that time. 
So when we go ahead and talk about this music, it is not as if it is separate and apart from the struggle of African people, because it is not. Now, with that as kind of like a start, what I did is I just took some photos and things that I've uh, used in the past and put them together to talk about, because the East organization, how many people have heard of the East organization? East organization was an organization that existed from about 1969 to about 1989, uh, actually housed in Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, that it was a, you know, as we said, it was an educational and cultural center for people of African descent. That there was a school, the largest black independent school of its time called Uhura Sasa, and one of the things that we understood is that we had to do things that would attract the people because we believe that it's important for a revolutionary organization to actually be at one with the people. And how do you best be at one with the people? You do things that the people like to do. You provide goods and services that the people need to have. So, the East organization developed, we developed one of the first food cooperatives in Brooklyn, the Uhuru Food Co-op, also known as Kunuluan. We had a clothing store, we had a bookstore, we had a catering service. We had the school, as I said, and we also had a cultural center. And in the cultural center, we did education. We did education all, all different times uh, during the week. And on the weekend, we went ahead and brought in some of the most respected musicians of the time who came and played at the East because it became almost another home for them, we have to say. That, uh, and well, I'll show you. Let's go ahead. First, I have a picture here, a picture here of Baba Kasisi G2 Wayusi, founder of the East. Uh, and important, and again, one of the things that we as African people do is we say we have to uh, give praise to the ancestors. And uh, Baba Jitu left us in, if I recall, 2014. So uh, he's an ancestor. But one that still is around, as a matter of fact, tomorrow we are going to the community board in Bedford Stuyvesant to facilitate the co naming of Clavo Place, where the East was for Jitu Wings. Uh, I should have included Baba Miri Baraka. The last time I did a panel on music was part of the Vision Festival, and that was one of the last times that I was actually able to sit with Baba Amiri, who's been a longtime friend. Uh, Baba Juma remembers, because he was there. We had a great time. Here's the East. This is the logo. This is the entrance at 10 Claver Place. Uh, as I said, the organization began in 1969. I joined the organization in 1971. I knew about it from 69. I first moved to Brooklyn from the Bronx in 69 and would hang out. And one of the things that attracted me was what? The music. Not just the politics, but of course understanding that our lives are multifaceted. We want to do more than just listen to music. And the East provided a place for me to go ahead and do more than just listen to music. Uh, the door opened the east. Now here's the crowd at the east. All right. One of the things that people argue is that, well, black people, the regular folks, don't like that music. <laughs> but what would happen is that this place, as you can see, is filled to the brim that there are people of uh, all generations. If you look right at the front by the microphone, you can actually see a sister who has her baby in her arms. So it wasn't a matter of like this was eclectic or this was something that was, well, you know, a, a particular ilk, a particular class of people would go. The people came to the East. Pharaoh Sanders, performing at the East. All right, in the background, uh, the artwork of Baba 
say to Jim Dyson, who had, uh, well, a really famous uh, mural right behind where all of the musicians would perform. Milford Graves. Yeah. Had Milford Graves on my radio program, a film. Did anybody have the opportunity to see the Milford Graves film, Full Mantis? Uh, as a matter of fact, I had uh, Bob Milford on my radio program. I do a radio program on WBAI. Had him on two weeks before the first showing, and it was already sold out. So I was like, yo, this can't happen. So I told everybody, you have to call the box office. And uh, about a week later, I got a call from Bob Milford, and he said, man, I don't know what you started, but you started something, because they had to add another showing of the film. <laughs> so that's the people speaking. You know, that's not Lincoln Center, which was where the film was actually shown, speaking or doing something. They were <coughs> responding to the people, and the people responded when it was found out that the showing was uh, the first showing, and the only showing at that particular time was, in fact, sold out. M. Tume. M. Tume, as a matter of fact, I think I saw the album, the Emoja Ensemble it's moving around. around now, yeah. uh, uh, that particular album was recorded at Tanglaver Place at the East. Uh, as a matter of fact, to talk more about the East and recordings, there's a, um, there is a uh, album, Pharaoh Sanders, Pharaoh Sanders Live at the East. It wasn't at the East, but what happened is that the crowd from the East was brought to where it was recorded so that they could create the same atmosphere that the East actually represented. So you hear people at the end, you know, cheering and doing all kinds of things like folks used to do at the East. <laughs> Give me an example. <laughs> Sonny Rollins came and performed. And he came out, and before he played a note, the crowd got up, and they just started yelling and screaming. They called him genius. They called everything. People bowed down. They did all kinds of stuff. And Sonny, had the saxophone and he looked out at the crowd and he had never experienced anything like that before. Mm. And the crowd sat down and I gotta tell you, Sonny played probably the best set that he ever played in his life. Because we have to understand that the music is symbiotic. It's not a matter of musicians just playing music. It's a matter of the music being played and the audience responding to it. And that's one of the things that he Jewel Tyson, I got a lot of uh, uh, photos in terms of uh, Sun Ra. People talk about Afrofuturism now. And Sun Ra is the original Afrofuturist. You know, he told us a long time ago, it's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? <laughs> and when we go ahead and look at what's happening, we see you know, yesterday it was, what, 87 degrees? Today the high is 61. Last week it was, uh, the temperature went down 20 degrees in 15 minutes. You know, there are things that are happening, and we got to say that Sun Ra kind of knew what was going on and was hipping people to that a long time ago. Here's a, a poster from the East. All right. Eddie Gale, Gary Bartz, Buck Clark, Soul Session every Sunday, donation, $2. $2. One of the things that we knew is that you had to do stuff that the people could afford. You know, one of the problems we have now, and you know, I'm not even going to talk about it now, is that what has happened in terms of music in general and the recording industry, and what has happened in regards to people performing music and why it's so difficult for the music to really be performed in all of the kinds of venues that it needs to be performed in. Put in the Black News, talked about it, that's just one cover. I, we've got covers in regards to music specific, and one of the things that we'll be doing over a period of time is digitizing a lot of that, archiving it, because it, it really needs to be done. That was the news magazine of the East, of which I was the editor, from 1974 to 1979. The music was also, it inspired people who are artists. This is some of the work of Ron Warwell, one of our artists who came to the East and did so much 
of the artwork in regards to the flyers. Here we have Pharaoh Sanders, Gary Barts. Looking up. Speaking in terms of the elevation, the elevation of our people. And again, two pyramids and the sun. Here, more work by Warwell. Umoja, which is Kiswahili means what? And he will know. Unity. And one of the things that we looked for was the unity of our people and the music in regards to where it was performed, how it was performed, led to bringing our people together. Is that it? Ah, one more piece by Warwell. Here we have James Pauling, along with Marcus Garvey, Nelson Mandela, That's it for me for now. Um, I would only say that while the East is not in existence anymore, that one of the institutions that came out of the East was what we first called the African Street Carnival, which became the African Street Festival, which is now the International African Arts Festival which is held in downtown Brooklyn every year. This year will be the 47th year. Uh, it starts on June 30th and extends until July 4th. And uh, I served as the chairman of the festival for about 14 years or so. Yes. We're going to hear more from Professor Nchawe. Uh, we've just been blessed with the arrival of our other panelist, Mr. Juma Sultan. <laughs> Guiding force behind Studio We, New York Musicians Festival. Uh, and then after that, a long running series of uh, outdoor concerts that I myself remember. In fact, I think my father had a long poster with a lineup where everybody was playing in each park <laughs> on the wall. So thank you. Um, um, I want to pick up on a little bit what yes. we were talking about and kind of open up the discussion, if that's all right. Um, I, when I was thinking about this, this discussion and refreshing myself um, on, yeah, just the body of music and communities that came together around the four of you, frankly, um, I was, you know, my first instinct was to talk about, okay, how in order to produce jazz, you needed a lot of self-determination. I think looking at Nation Time, looking at the studio, looking at these, all of these things needed a lot of self-determination, a lot of faith, trust, love in the music, and, and faith in its power, and, you know, the, the need and the urgency of putting that forward, right? And that's a conversation that I think has been had a lot about jazz. But actually, also looking at your careers, what you realize is that there is so much jazz can teach us about self-determination, right? There's so much that jazz can do in terms of self-determination. I think it's really interesting that you started off with a quote from Secretore, the Canadian president, about how revolution is, starts with culture. He's a really interesting figure, because he did, I don't know if he knows about Secretary, but he did cell phone records, the really major West African traditional albums that we hear were defined a lot by his production, right? At the same time, Secretore, you know, he was a huge diplomatic figure, was really highly respected in large part for, for a lot of the cultural work he did. Um, but later, you know, I think a lot of people working with him looked back with regret because he was also diametrically opposed to other ethnic groups, right? He instituted the black diet um, and starved whole ethnic groups that he regarded as political enemies. So I think that as much as culture can be positive, right, it can also be negative, and I think there are negative things happening right now in our culture that can be eroding and can, can work against us. And you guys have had such long careers. I would be so interested <laughs> to hear you guys comment about those forces at play, that push and pull um, with politics and music. I mean, Nation Time in particular um, is such a founda foundational kind of musical text in that regard. And I'd love to speak about 
to hear you, Joe, speak about your inspiration when you were working on that and the impact that it's had since. Well, uh, Nation Time uh, succeeded another record, uh, um, which almost happened accidentally. Um, one called Underground Railroad, which was the first uh, recording I made for a, a, a label called CJR, Craig Johnson uh, Records. And that happened because um, a friend was invited to just an ordinary concert, heard the music and suggested that I might want to make a solo recording. And I said, absolutely not, we want to hear that. And he bought equipment and just started recording. And subsequently, uh, I was teaching at Vassar College in a course called A Revolution in Sound in 1970. Uh, there was a lot going on. The Vietnam War was going on. The Kent State happened and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, music that came from my listening to people like Sun Ra, Archie Jeff, and John Coltrane. So, uh, you were talking about John Coltrane uh, killing the music? That was it? Chasing, chasing, chasing people away. Chasing, chasing, chasing. Well, Lou Donaldson said it. <laughs> no, not you. You didn't say it. Well, I'm kind of curious. I wonder like, uh, uh, how that happened because at the time that Nation Time was recorded, that band came out of music that was in a, a club uh, from a band called um, Ira and the Soul Project. And it was music, it was a kind of social music coming from dancing. It was drawing people in from that. And on top of that, we put Archie Shep, Sun Ra, and everybody else. And that was bringing people in. So culturally, that's how, how that happened. Um, I would say, um, because I was a part of the uh, New York Jazz Festival as well. I was in there, met Warren at that time, and, and probably this gentleman here as well, we were all involved. This was like 1972? Uh, 72, 73, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we were in the mix for a long time. Right. Uh, I don't know more to say than could, that. Could, could, I, could I just amplify that a little bit? I have a picture, a framed poster on my wall in my house of the 1972 Jazz Festival which you and I and, and a whole bunch of other groups hosted. And it was so effective that, what's the guy's name? To George Wayne. Newport Jazz Festival. George, 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 George Wayne came to me personally with concern that it was going to attract attention away from his festival. Of course, that was complete bullshit anyway, because there were plenty of people around, and we all didn't have any trouble attracting. No, no. But he was concerned uh, because the first year we attracted all the press. Exactly. The uh, uh, 30 events around the clock for the, uh, for the five days. And uh, that's when he started approaching other people because they came the next year with their 20th anniversary and they did not want the interference. But all the foreign press, uh, instead of attending the Newport concerts, were attending uh, the minor events in clubs and uh, uh, galleries and we were getting daily press uh, from the New York Times, the Post. I have all those articles in archive also, you know, at this time. And so that's that's what you're speaking on. Yeah, right? exactly. About that. Yeah. And as you said, he came to you personally. I've had personal meetings with him, along with the other uh, uh, board members during that time. Yeah. And I might add, we didn't have any financial support. We were doing this all person to person. You know, well, we were attracting people who were attracting people. And a lot of international people were coming in there, and I think that's what disturbed you, that they were more interested in the new music that we were creating. We, I mean, it wasn't all new music, but it was different, and it was something that people hadn't been exposed to as much. And that's what the people coming from other countries really wanted to check out. Right. Uh, basically, they wanted to check out the community aspect. As you mentioned, Studio We, uh, Studio We was there. Uh, the umbrella organization was Society, James DuBois brought it in from Pittsburgh, yes, yes. Society of Universal Cultural Arts. And the object of that was what uh, we were we were always connected uh, in some respect, uh, musically or, or somewhere, with all the ma uh, major organizations from you, from uh, from 
that uh, 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 bed sty and restoration for the easement of every, everyone, and also individuals uh, that were just creating spaces uh, that had galleries and uh, just other places. If you had a venue, not even the size of this room, there was music going on, and we were we were uh, presenting. It was a presenting organization that presented music in the parks. And as you said, we didn't have uh, much money. This is one reason why we consider collaborating with the new board on the on the 20th anniversary coming here, you know, because we were able to pay uh, uh, close to union wages in Alice Tully Hall and Carnegie Hall, and that caused some dissension among the ranks too. But uh, one thing about that organization is that uh, people, uh, even though I mean cats have jumped on table, disagree, uh, and uh, but we still walked out of their brothers in, in, in the community spirit. Rashi Ali, he was opposed to going to, uh, and he wrote a letter to us and said, hey, you know, we sold out, but we still continued and, and, and did venues when he opened up his, uh, his place. You know, same with Sam, you know, and Sam Future. He was under the umbrella, and there's many organizations, Sam Drivers, I was talking about, he worked with them. I don't know if there was ever anything like that, because I've got, I've got posters from uh, showing all the musicians who were involved, and it was extraordinary. It was, I don't think anything like that's ever happened Wait, since. Well, you and Jenny Du Bois, you, know, you mentioned to you way back in 1968 to me. You know, I know you and him were close, you know, closer than you and I, I at that time to move him around. But uh, James was an uh, unsung hero of what he was trying to do and the ideas that he was pushing during those days because it was about what he says, Omaha, about bringing all, all the communities together. Uh, there were there were political problems yeah, and there were things that you were asking because uh, uh, we got attacked because uh, uh, in reference to what we were trying to do community-wise, it was studio way a community organization, and uh, there were certain factors that we agreed on that were, through our experience that we did not want to let on, and so we were uh, uh, in a way they called us racist. We weren't racist; we were just community uh, national life in our community. And we didn't. We see. We saw the takeover in so many other organizations where you uh, allow people to come in, and it's about all the uh, various cultures and all the different music, as he says. Uh, there, we were playing. Um, basically, I was playing just straight free jazz. So, uh, I was uh, um, assistant director. I don't even know the title right now. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, I handled most of the scheduling, and it wasn't prejudice. We we did Sam Whitting, Barry Harris. It's just so many other uh, cross sections from uh, of music, and so it wasn't about just because we we our predilection was about a certain era of music. Uh, we were open to all areas of music, and uh, you know, so that, that's what made it uh, such a tight knit group. I mean, the <coughs> younger generation I see like guys like we presented uh, when we had the opportunity uh, uh, to play at uh, Carnegie Hall. We presented jazz to new generation, and uh, we compromised. What was her name? I mean, it's McFarland. I mean, they, they, we had to put her on the program because George Wayne promised to put her on. But uh, everybody else was like under 20, 20, 20 in their early 20s. Or they make me, uh, Cal Massey, uh, son, you know, just different people coming along as well. But, so uh, that's all. Yeah. I mean, I guess what my, my, my personal question, and we don't need to stick to it at all, uh, but the question that I'm trying to to point to is that frankly we take culture for granted as having a positive life, as having community. But in, in fact, it takes a lot of work, a lot of vision, a lot of, you know, it takes a lot. <laughs> and in fact, and if it if it is ne if that's neglected, I think culture can actually be weaponized against, people, right? And I think it is. It and already so, is. Back yeah, I think it already oh, yeah. is. And so I guess I'm just really curious, you know, having done. You know, such successful projects having brought so many communities together. What your visions are for right now, or your hopes are for right now, the ways that culture. And in fact, I guess you know we talked about Sun Ra before, right? He's become a huge inspiration for Afrofuturists. You have politicians running to be mayor on an Afrofuturist platform, right? And I guess thinking about your careers, thinking about your music, and you know the impact that it's had will continue to have. How do you hope that vision of community to continue on today? We started having political meetings. Some of them were at my place. I know you had some also at your place. But we developed a group called Collective Black Artists. All right? And 
there was an independent music label in Detroit called Strata Records. And some of those Detroit musicians came here and started Strata East Records. All right. And we opened up a um, catalog. Well, all right, that's two of mine, but I mean, so many other people <laughs> were just recording their own music independently, and the only way we could get it published, because Columbia wasn't coming after us, all the other big record companies, we started putting out and getting so much attention underground that they had to come and recognize us as a valid label. Yeah. And um, I don't know how many, I think at one point I had a catalog that had over 30 different releases just in that two or three years when we started, you know. When everybody started getting interested in producing themselves because we weren't being offered jobs at the Newport Jazz Festival and this and that and the other, you know. So we just created our own festivals and, and made them move over and give us room. Let me just say something in terms of Strata East because uh, Strata East Records ended up having a radio play hit and that is, they uh, recorded the first edition of Gil Scott Heron's Winter in America. That's right. And the tune, The Bottle, became a dance hit and pop hit, and that was Strata East. So, you know, that, that essentially was a wedge for Strata East to go ahead and have their product actually more heard and uh, more distributed because of that. Um, unfortunately, we're coming up already on the end of our hour, um, and for a discussion that yeah. probably we should take no, we several. No, we're not an hour. Three fifty. Oh, we got another hour. hour? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> does anybody have? <laughs> I, thought we were, I thought it was two to three. Nobody tells no. us. No. You know, there, there's I'm a agree to record in particular that is going around now. That is one of the, the few documents documents in sound of what Mr. Sultan just mentioned, what everybody mentioned about the New York Musicians Festival from Trumpeter Earl Cross that came out on a German label. I'm not sure about the circumstances, but uh, that's one of the uh, documents in sound of that festival. And of course, WKCR FM has an archive of tapes as well from that whole time, and I'm sure the musicians do as well, and uh, the records here that I brought uh, correspond to uh, the musical careers of uh, our leading lights on this panel here, and uh, the subject matter that's being discussed. And in reference to the New York Musicians Festival, uh, again, the formation of that was at Studio We, right, Mr. Sultan? Well, it, it, um, no. Studio We was the administration. Mm -hmm. uh, it really formulated at the University of the Streets. That's when everybody That's came right. together. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but the University of the Streets, 7th Avenue and B, uh, it was uh, people, Sam Rivers, uh, Noah Howard, Rashi Ali, Andrew Hill. It's just a plethora of people. Uh, the first, when we started, there were about 25. <coughs> Some of the guys backed down because they didn't want to do the leg work. So, uh, but basically, I just want to answer your question that you asked before, because my opinion is that uh, he was he had Oma job there. And so in the 60s, we were all talking about unity. And so uh, people, as I mentioned before, tried to make us out as a racialists. And we're not, because uh, in, in, uh, just conscious of the environment and through experience. And so uh, what we need now is the same type of uh, thing in that cycle there. And, and, and because, because I stand up for, for my family, my people, whatever, uh, here doesn't mean that I'm opposed to anyone. Because I, uh, so many people have operated on the, what I call the agape principle of love overflowing. And uh, uh, that's, that's the problem I see in the black community. If we go to church, we go here, and we're always forgiving. And it's fine. And I, I believe in that. I believe in, in, in the power of, the, of, of uh, positive, uh, positive output. And so we need uh, more of that in the community. And we also, when people come together and nationalize, instead of it being derogatory, say, say that we get together and we do something, and then, okay, so, so we're considered a black organization. 
And people automatically, I've seen through history, I'm 76 years old, and I've seen through history where it's come against. I've experienced Jim Crow, racism, I, uh, all, all different types of things in my life. And, uh, and we, uh, I don't experience uh, so much right now. I go down south because personally, I rise above it. People come on negative. I know how to diffuse uh, those type of tensions. Now, you get into situations where you can't, but I'm just saying that uh, uh, a level of, of awareness and consciousness in, in uh, uh, humanity. Uh, I, played, I played with uh, guys like Jimi Hendrix. Okay, now he was, he was, he was a person, uh, and, and he said, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't classify things in terms of uh, black and white. I, I, I look for uh, uh, the old and the new. That's basically where he was looking for to divorce old thing and, and move on to a newer level. And so uh, people like him and other people, Martin Luther King, I marked you with Martin, I'm just saying, with, uh, that had great states of mind and great things to uh, embark into other individuals. And, that, and as a musician and artist, forget the musician, and culturally, as an answer to your question, is that we inform the people uh, because there, there is something coming through us that we can uh, educate and uh, give people information that uh, normally they don't uh, come to. I, I used to be in, in the church and uh, a praiser, worshiper, and they use the music to uh, open your heart to, you can receive whatever word they're presenting in that respect. You know? And so I, I look at music that to uh, raise uh, the vibration and uh, of all people, it's not just about, because uh, right now I'm wearing Aboriginal, Aboriginal Music Society, 1968, we established that. Sonny Simmons, myself, Sonny Murray, a whole bunch of folks. Upstate New York. Uh, and it's, it's Abba, father of origin of music. So that means that we take you, we take you, we take you. We all come from different cultures and mixed cultures. And uh, we just take uh, uh, configurations, our, our sound. Every every tribe has their, their sound. And so uh, it's the same with uh, the world. That's why they say jazz is the world music, because people play those things around the world. So it's about making people aware, especially the younger people, because uh, a lot of us won't be here another 20, 30 years. So, you know, uh, it's too well. <laughs> 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 I, I didn't say I would. I say I would. <laughs> but anyway, but no, it's, it's, it's about, it's about that, that spirit, see, and it's about the spirit. And, and, and most musicians I carry, okay, we're talking about the political aspect. Well, during the 60s, there were guys uh, that were political, and there were guys that were intellectual, that were with the diversity, but it's about meeting people on the level and finding uh, a common bond behind and over and that's basically. I also bought some examples of, uh, <laughs> of some recordings that Mr. Sultan has appeared on as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that Negro is interesting because yes. you, you, get, uh, you get a very eclectic with uh, uh, Sonny Simmons playing English horn. With an African instrument, and then we just show you a combination of indigenous sound. Although we play a, a little, s somewhat bop on there, different areas. Are you a native New Yorker? No, I'm a native of California. Okay, I I came from Chicago. Now I came here in 1957, finished school, and never went back to live. You know, because. There wasn't anything like the excitement that I found here in Chicago alone. But now, since I got here, I saw a group of people coming from St. Louis. Another group came from Detroit. You know, um, all these different areas came, and each group established themselves initially as a group from that particular area. Right. You know, but when we began to get together and intermingle all this, the whole thing just exploded. And, and, and provide us uh, a lot more attention than we've gotten sent Right. Well, just to uh, add on to that, they had an organization in, in, the, in the 60s in St. Louis called BAG. BAG. They were, yeah. they were basically a, a community uh, uh, organization. It was uh, all the programs were going on at that time, and they offered a, a wide diversity of culture, uh, not just, uh, not just, they had a culture centers, and they offered a, a wide diversity. And so when that closed down, uh, the musicians from that uh, migrated here. He's talking about Chicago, ACM, uh, you know, ACM, 
that's the only organization right now going through that period that still is active. Uh -huh. And they are, but but they uh, you can look at them as farms. You know, in my mind, you know, they they, they grew people and people moved from that uh, to higher things. From David Murray to uh, just on and on. I, I don't even start mentioning names, but uh, you know, all the guys from there. Uh, and and what happened was that they come to New York and they merge and they. And, but they, you all we always have the guys come in that that you played with back home, and, you mm -hmm. know, and there was just a, such a, a mixture. So, uh, and, and they mixed, they came in uh, during that period, uh, interested in, in the organizations that were going on to New York, here in New York, and you know, and seeing how, how things can be affiliated. And they made their choices and, and moved, you know, moved on. For me, I, I uh, wasn't born in New York. I, I was born in Miami, Florida. I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, where I still live. And uh, for me, I was kind of, uh, I didn't get to play too much in New York City until eventually I, I was invited. But early on, the, the people I played with were playing mostly, our music was coming from James Brown, from Marvin Gaye, from everybody else. And I infused Coltrane and Ornette and Eric Dolphy and all of those people to make this nation time thing. I brought them together to do that. And uh, so now I get invited and it's great, I love it here. <laughs> yeah, I get invited. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very interesting theme that's coming up is bringing people together, right? You can't be just a lone soldier trying to do your thing. You have to involve the community. People have to be engaged with what you're saying about having intergenerational spaces, um, places that serve, you know, again, you're saying it's not about being racist, it's about taking care of community, bringing them together. And what would you say have been the biggest tools to you in terms of bringing people together, in terms of mobilizing people, in terms of making that happen? It, it helps a lot when you have a studio or, or a place, you know, when I... <laughs> or facility. Mm. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we were both very fortunate to, to have maintained these spaces for mine lasted over a period of 30 years, you know. And now it seems like it's gone by in a flash. But, um, I had a, a place across the street here, the building is no longer there because they've got this big edifice up there, on 59th Street and 10th Avenue. And it was a five floor walk up, carrying my drums, you know, but it was a place where I could practice without disturbing my family. You know, I had four girls growing up and, you know, we needed, they didn't have room for a drummer in my house. <laughs> so, so I created that, and then I moved on to 21st Street, which was a floor-through loft. The, these were a, a whole bunch of lofts in the garment district, and the garment district had gone out of business. So a whole bunch of us went down there. The, the first rent I paid was, I think, in fact, the last one I paid was like $225 a month. $250 a month. You know, like I was buying a house and had that studio, and my whole nut was like $500 a month. And, and I mean, I could make it like that even in those times. But people started coming in. We, I started my band rehearsing every Friday. And my uh, partner, Anton Reed, said, you know, we ought to just do some concerts. So instead of having rehearsals, we started having concerts. And other people started coming. And then other groups, I know Sam Rivers started doing his studio with us, the studio Rippy. Studio Rippy. Rippy. And um, uh, singer Jolie Wilson. Right. Ladies for Ladies for it, right. You know, and, and so this thing just came on and came on. And then, uh, after that 30 years, there was another real estate evolution where all of those places became unaffordable. In fact, the buildings got knocked down and now they've got these high-rise, you know, condo apartments in those same places where we were beginning to Gentrification. Mm -hmm. now, now, a friend of mine, um, Jimmy Owens, had a lawyer, and he was kind of studying all these situations. He says, you know what happens is that you move into these places that are affordable, and nobody is there, and then you start creating your art, it could be painting, it could be acting, it could be dance, or music, and you start attracting this group of people coming in constantly, and then some people want to move in, and that elevates the whole real estate value. So that what happened was after that time, almost all these places got wiped out and replaced by condos 
but then the music got wiped out, and the art got wiped out. Mm -hmm. right? You know, so now everybody mostly depends on what do you call them, grants. You know, and extremely hard when you're trying to create music to change your mind and go seeking grants. You know, I mean, it's always difficult. Right. And what was uh, that leads into Studio We as well? How was that found? And then I'll get to. Professor Chadwick, and then we'll his next question. Yeah. But how did um, what was Studio E? Uh, first of all, um, Studio E, there was a gentleman, piano player, Burton Green. He moved up oh, state, wow. and uh, 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 he left a grand piano on the uh, second floor uh, on 193 Eldridge Street. And he and James Du Bois were friends. And uh, James Du Bois was a trumpet player also. And uh, it was a place, he was looking at it as a place to rehearse. And uh, Studio E started, uh, it didn't start as a nonprofit. He started it in 1968, and he started with a, uh, a three day program called Music Through the Ears. And he invited, he invited all this a, a group of musicians. And, and after that, people encouraged him, and uh, he started holding weekly concerts there. And, uh, and then he pulled out his Bible 1C3 from Philadelphia because he had a, he had a situation at an institution in Pittsburgh. Uh, prior to that, uh, which was called the Society of Universal Culture Arts, it was influenced by other older musicians. See, a lot of people don't realize uh, how, how many shoulders we stand on. We can go back to people trying to fight for self-determination. And here in New York, uh, since the early 1900s up in Harlem, when they had separate unions for black and whites and, and different uh, Things like that, so that we, we stand on a lot of history. We look at it. We look at the. We look at. We we, we drew for our festival. We drew on on, on, on Max and Mingus at uh, the alternative festival there. We we drew on uh, Bill Dixon. You know, uh, you know, different people that were, have always been trying to organize. John Coltrane, uh, uh, Ola Tunji, and Yusef Latif right here on 150. Yeah. So there's so much information out here that people are, aren't aware of. And so I'm saying that the, the key to what you your question again is education, and, and we can put the information. I, I, I'm friends with him. He puts up Ross put out a lot of information, but we need to uh, mm -hmm. inspire more younger people. Uh, and uh, I, I work I work with uh, he was talking about this. I work with guys who deal with uh, underground producers in Brooklyn. They deal with virtual reality, and uh, you know I. Uh, I come in to show them what reality is sometimes. way beyond me. He's a young guy, you know, but I still have a pulse, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm not that in tune to hip hop, rap, all of it. I work in a lot of all areas. I've worked with those areas, you know. In fact, I work with people mentioning Bill Scott. I'm with the uh, Bill Scott Heron uh, Evolutionary Band. We just got the Winter Festival, you know what I'm saying, but we're keeping certain traditions of, of our life. So, um, the young people and education, that's the only way we're going to do it. And, and also uh, teach them about coming together. And uh, they're, they're doing it in, in other areas, but a lot of the messages that they have out there isn't education, isn't uplifting, isn't, isn't, isn't even fruitful. It's like, uh, to me, I find a lot of it. A lot of the music that come on, uh, I listen to them. I'm with my my 19-year-old grandson from college right now, and he turns on the radio, and I have to tell him, turn it down. Because some of that music, you know, some of that music, I'll be driving, I'll be driving on the road in a nice state of mind, and then I'll, all of a sudden I'll find myself jumping, you know, and it's the music, you know, and I don't listen to it personally. Excuse me, yes, sir. I'm gonna toss out an idea that's percolating in my mind. Hey, so hold on, can I ask Mr. and Chalva one sure. question? I mean, you you're about to say, and do we have a Q and A? Thanks. The major thing is, you know, first of all, number one, and, and this is key in regards to culture, but also in terms of politics and everything else, and that is that we need to be organized, and that we're not. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that we have to critically build institutions. It's not enough to go ahead and do whatever. You have to have institutions. So when we built the East, there was an institution, and institutions have grown out of that. I mentioned the International African Arts Festival, which is now 47 years old. How do we go ahead and continue that for another 47 years? That's a major question, of course. Um, I, I always work with institutions. 
because it's important that we have them, especially in the context we have to understand that in terms of the educational system, they took music education and art education and physical education, for that matter, out of the schools on purpose. Okay? There was a purpose to that. Okay? So, as we understand that, it means that we have to create community institutions that will begin to fill some of that void until we can take the schools back. Okay? Because ultimately, the struggle, this is the 50th year of the struggle for community control in New York City. All right? Back in 1968 was the major confrontation between the unions and the independent school districts in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and in Harlem right. IS-201. That's 50 years ago this year. All right? So it's incumbent upon us to understand that and move the schools away from, you know, and again, when Bloomberg got the schools, it was the great white father knows best. <laughs> Okay, and we know that that was not the case, all right? You did not know the best. Now it's time to go ahead and rekindle that struggle for community control so that parents and communities have control of the schools and the buildings and the institutions. We need facilities. The facilities are there. We have taxpayer buildings all over the place that the community does not have access to. So we have to struggle in that regard as well. Yeah, let, let, let me please um, add on to that. When I came here in 1957, there was no such thing as jazz studies, all right? Now, people came to us for jazz studies. I mean, people from all cultures and all directions came and hung out at our studios for that. In the 1970s, we went up to Amherst, Massachusetts, and it was a big meeting. Max Roach was very prominent. He was teaching there. And this was one of the first times that black jazz performers were able to start being college professors. All right? Now, I, I managed to do that for 30 years and got out, you know, retired professor of music, or whatever it is, associate professor of music. But before that, there you would get penalized if you were caught improvising in a school practice room. Mm -hmm. I mean, cats would come along and say, oh, he's not playing written music. You've got to pay a 25 cent fine, or, or you lose your privilege, you know. I mean, it was just that particularly, I, I don't know what they were afraid of seeing happen, but, but you know, uh, there were certain, uh, well, people like John Cage, we kind of blow some of the roof off some of the structure of the four, four, and the six, eight, and then da 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 da. da mm -hmm. You know, everything had to be conducted, but that began to open up a door when people could see a use for improvisation. Now it's throughout the whole world of music. You know, and another strange thing I like to add on to is that a lot of drummers would come to us, a lot of Caucasian drummers because they were finding that all their employment in Broadway shows and in pit orchestras and as far as certain composers were, were employing things that were particular personalities of black music, of African American music. And so they had to come and learn those skills so that they could still play. We just went to see the Book of Mormons the other day, my wife and I. And it's full of quote unquote jazz, you know, and great music. I mean, you can see the black influence in that culture. But they found out that they had to do that in order to keep up with the times and stay relevant. And Mr. McPhee, what did you find? Because you were at Vassar College in Nation no. Time was recorded. That it was in a uh, program, um, it was a black studies program called, uh, I titled it, A Revolution in Sound music after bebop, uh, leading to Coltrane and Ornette Coleman and Eric Golfi and that sort of thing. Um, it was off campus, and uh, I just brought as much, it, it, I was bringing from downtown Poughkeepsie that music 
uh, that we were playing on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights for, to dance. And I preceded those dance programs with uh, as much revolutionary music as I possibly could to introduce people to open ears, to be able to hear what was coming down the tracks. And uh, so Vassar gave me that opportunity. Uh, I don't know how happy they were with it. But then, <laughs> <laughs> then um, Kent State happened and everything stopped. Uh, Nixon and the, and the uh, Vietnam War thing was happening and there was a lot of suspicion uh, about the music and, uh, but we just did it. You know, like I said, I live in Poughkeepsie. To this day, I can't play there. I wow. never get invited there. I have to get out and go someplace else to play. And I, I have a family who invites me, and uh, I'm very fortunate in that. Why don't can't you play Poughkeepsie? <laughs> oh, let me say this. You mean specifically I Vassar? Worked for, I worked for about 18 years in an automotive ball bearing factory so I could make enough money to get out of town and go to Europe and play with my friends there. And one time, uh, people in that factory asked me, said, what did you do on your vacation? I said, well, I went to France and I played with my friends. Really? If you're that good, why did you come back? So I could get enough money so I can go the next time. <laughs> and then they said, oh, do you have any recordings? And I gave them a copy of... Uh, Underground Railroad, and they gave it back to me the next day, and they said, "People actually pay you to play that shit." <laughs> <laughs> so I learned that I couldn't, I couldn't uh, give them the music. Yeah. They wouldn't come to hear it. I had to get out, mm -hmm. and it's still happening to this day. Mm -hmm. Not putting a bad thing on yeah. Poughkeepsie, but that's just the way it is. It's not only in Poughkeepsie. I mean, it is a fascinating phenomenon that has continued. That I mean. A, you go, you go to Europe and no one see it sudden, you, you know, bands that, you know, have really struggled to bring out turnout here are heavily, heavily valued. And then equally, you know, the big festivals here are inviting European artists. You know, they've got tons of, of community here in, in New York, and yet the, you know, festival celebrating, particularly jazz, you know, you see a lot of artists from, artists from the outside as opposed to artists locally. And, um, but I do think we're in an interesting time where you see artists uh, I mean, people are always making jazz, always making new jazz, but you're seeing artists who are pulling on from tropes of that are already playing at Bobby and all of this. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, you guys talked about space, right? You need space, you need facility you, to bring a community together and to, to enact self-determination, right? And a lot of times those spaces and those communities, those, that can be facilitated by the music. This is what I'm kind of gathering from what I'm hearing. But I'm curious, it's, um, you know, seeing people now pulling on from that music in, in, in very ways that to me feel very familiar. Um, do you see also younger people building those spaces? And if so, why not? And what do you think, what do you think is going on right now with that kind of music? Do you have any opinions on that? <laughs> well, I, there, uh, take, uh, okay, uh, in reference to what you said, um, I, I can't remember the name, uh, but Jimmy Garrison's son has a space. Yeah. And uh, he's a younger, he's a younger person. Shapeshifter. Shapeshifter, Shape excuse me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but he, he has a, a similar, he has music there, he has similar symposiums and, uh, and different activities. So to say, uh, yes, I, I see it happening, yeah. but I don't see it happening in a degree. And so you do. I'm thankful for small things, but I just look at that and I look at other, other areas. You know, Overtime, over sisters, you know, there are places, uh, and, and it's not just limited to Manhattan, right. all over uh, here, and it's not limited to New York. I've seen it, like, uh, uh, primarily, uh, I've, I've had many seminars on, on the loft jazz scene from 1968 to 85, and, uh, but that was happening all over the country, you know. You had guys, and uh, you know, you were talking about Mary. I mean, I was on the back of a trailer with him back in the '60s when he was doing things on the streets in Oakland and, and different. You know, uh, you know. I'm just saying, it, nobody mentioned Artist House. You know, I mean, just this is so many different venues and people. Not, but not, you know, not Artist House, but uh, I was talking about in, in uh, Newark. Spirit House. Spirit, Spirit House. House. Yeah, this is Jihad right, Records, right. which was a um, music label. Excuse me, Mr. Certainly. That was a. Yeah, right. Well, he, I mean, uh, similar, similar to these, 
he had he just had a, a monumental artist coming in and, and doing different things. His sister had a place on a hundred. You know what I mean? So so there was just so many people struggling, and uh, you know the thing is, uh, if, if if everyone could have uh, come under one umbrella, which people desire the heart. Uh, but we were, we were we were fighting for survival, and also uh, you had mentioned uh, uh, grants. You know, musicians like myself, listen, left brain, right brain. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you got to turn off. I, 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 was, I was trained as a paralegal. It takes me a day to even think anywhere near that. I have to get my head into it. You know, I'm not on any drugs anymore, so I can't flip like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but. You know, during those days, uh, I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a separation. So, in terms of grants, you know, uh, my, my idea is that I received a grant uh, from the National Endowment, but uh, personal in the, uh, in the last 10 years uh, to do a, a website. You might want to check it out. It's called uh, jumasarchive.org. And many of the people that we mentioned here, you not only see photographs, but uh, there's 30 second clips of their music. and uh, but. Uh, in terms of grant, uh, grants are like other any other industry or corporation. It depends on who you know. You lobby. Mm -hmm. You know, we we I, we went to with the union way back uh, to make jazz part of the American treasures. You know, and uh, to Washington D.C. and played in the house, Mogo and just a whole bunch of folks. You know, took two busloads uh, to D.C. But I'm saying uh, it's a. Uh, Grants, uh, to me, uh, are, uh, I, I, uh, I, know I won't seek any more grants, personally. And the last one I applied for was a Grammy, $20,000 to uh, do the archives. I, I made, after three years, the first run, and that was because I had people in there lobbying for me, you know, to get, get there. You know, my competition was Creative Music Studio. They received two years in a row, and we worked together, you know, with uh, uh, but. Uh, it's about who you know, and so I say, you know, you apply for the Green Foundation, the National Endowment, the Humanity. If you don't know nobody in there, you know, it's, it's like those records on the table that stay there until they hit the trash can, you know. Let me talk about the pop influence of, of the music, and, and we have to go back. If you remember uh, James Brown, Super Bad, mm -hmm. and you look at mm -hmm. the right. impact that people like John Coltrane and Albert Isla had on popular music. Right. If you go and look at Parliament Funkadelic, if you look at the influence in regards to Sun Ra had on the stage presentation that was made, where did the mothership come from? You know, what is that actually about? So, you know, we have to understand that on the popular level, people have appreciated some of this particular music and have attempted to try to incorporate it in what it is that they do. It was true then and it will be true now. But of course, you know, the, the issue now is uh, what has been done to literally attempt to try to repress this music. And you know, I think that once you talk about the idea that there are attempts at different times to repress African people, then of course in terms of the expressions that African people make will also, of course, be repressed in many different right. kinds of ways. One of the things that's happened in terms of many of our masters going to academia is that with private institutions charging what they charge, you find that most of the people who are actually attending these institutions are going to be white people. So that a link, a connection from generation to generation in regards to the music and the tradition has in fact not been lost but it's been, to an extent, changed. So we have to go ahead and understand that there's got to be means by which we actually go ahead and continue, uh, as Amiri Barak and many other people said, in the tradition. Yeah. But, but let, let me say something. Once you let an idea out of the bag, there's no way to put it back. All right? Now, the first time I went to Europe, I, I you know, I get off the plane and I'm walking around the street somewhere and people knew the group that I was with. And I think I was with the uh, Mary Brown or something, you know. And a guy comes up to me and he had on a dark suit and a white shirt and a white tie, glasses, and he looked very severe. And a German man like this, I'm saying, what's this guy? Norn Smith. And I said, okay, 
would you sign? <laughs> now, I, I didn't send it to Europe, but somehow the ideas got over there, and that wasn't the last time that that was going to happen. You know, in fact, I would say that we get a whole lot more attention, particularly as black musicians, in Europe than we do in the United States. They were just ready. I have uh, something to, to ask of both you and uh, Joe McPhee. Uh, as, uh, we were talking about sort of combinations and the, the movements uh, within black culture itself. The movement uh, from swing uh, into the, the sort of straight rhythms of R&B, which is something that you both pioneered uh, with Nation Time. And uh, your record with Sam Rivers' Sizzle has been like one of my favorite records for a very long time. Uh, but this is something that was uh, really did spread like wildfire, uh, wild, wild uh, fire. Um, yeah. Ronald Sharon Jacks, Shannon Jackson rather, has all these records where he does this sort of like, or prime time even, and uh, James Chance, uh, even all these guys were doing this like really stiff beats, but with this kind of wild meandering things. And I uh, see so you, both of you guys are very, uh, some of the original people doing this. Uh, but also, I was just kind of curious, uh, Joe, I know you played with um, Kevin Shea and Matt Motel and um, Jeff Bishop and uh, Weasel Walter. I was just kind of curious, um, where you see the music now being. I mean, obviously, I think it's lost a lot of this kind of, uh, I think because of the, the consequences, or the, the context has changed, there's not this sort of sense of community uh, in the way that um, it was sort of in the 70s or the late 60s. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, what, what kind of uh, movements have you seen? Is there anything that gives you hope for a sense of community within sort of improvised music and so on? Well, the people you mentioned, some of them like Matt and, uh, um, and people like that are people I've sort of found along the way. I, I, I have just um, not looked for a direction. I found it, you know, or it's found me. Um, I play a lot of electronic music. I'm interested in that. Um, just noise music, all kinds of things, every kind of sound possible. I like jet planes and subways, frogs, everything. And I put that all together and I don't, it's not about the instrumentation, it's not about me looking for some direction to lay on somebody. We put it out there. Uh, Warren was talking about this man in Germany or wherever it was. Oh yeah. I was in Bucharest with a group called Survival Unit and we had just finished a concert and standing on the street, the guys were having a smoke. And a young kid, he must have been in his late teens, early 20, passed by and sort of under his breath said, nation time. And I said, excuse me, what did you say? Um, and I called him back and I took out my phone and recorded. I said, can you say that again? He said, well, I have on my clock. What time is it? It's time to get up and go to work. Nation time. <laughs> <laughs> walking in the street. <laughs> Touch, and, you know, this music has reached out and touched all kinds of people. It's amazing. And like I say, I don't look for a direction, it finds me. That reminds me of um, everything that's been coming up within the conversation. And um, what was the cross fertilization like between the different social formations that were created? Because we talked about studio risk talk about Studio We in the East. Was there a lot of uh, exchange concerts and people collaborating with each other in that regard under the names of the, uh, the formations that were formed? Like the East in Brooklyn, uh, for instance, uh, a place that I remember, even though I was just a child, so I'm putting the word remember in quotes, because I was there usually with my father. He used to attend that place with great frequency. Sometimes he would take me with them and um, were, was the, in, in reference to the music, was the East also working with Studio We? Uh, not, not directly, you know. And, not to and, isolate that, but that the concert. Yeah, not, not directly. Now, uh, you know, Sam Rivers was someone who was, uh, you know, always around the East, you know, uh, we would do events or whatever and he would play uh, sometimes we would do larger events in other venues than Ten Flavor Place, and, and uh, you know Sam Rivers was you know one of the folks who uh, appreciated what we did. 
Now, you know, the, the, the issue, of course, is, you know, we were attempting to try to build this institution in bed -Stuy. And, uh, you know, the whole thing in terms of the loft movement or whatever, you know, we're talking about Lower East Side, we're talking about other kinds of neighborhoods, and it, sometimes it was, you know, difficult even in terms of exchange. I know, you know, myself as someone who attended music regularly, you know, sometimes I have to say, well, you know, I'm going to take the night off, I'm not going to be at the East because, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, you know, go to Studio We or go somewhere else or whatever as far as, you know, just trying to see what's happening. Then sometimes being exposed to another musician who we could, uh, in fact, you know, bring to the East. You know, we can invite them to actually go ahead and appear. So, you know, it, it uh, it works a couple of different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. And, and I'd like to just speak on that on the other side, is that although we weren't anywhere totally affiliated, there was, there was a link of support with all the East, because I was there, I performed there under the street festival, different things, under different different banners. And, and so uh, the East was, was, was recognized as a, a strong uh, institution to bring the black community together. Uh, Far, as far as I know. And so he did, as you said, Sam, there were other, uh, in terms of Studio Week, uh, we would help get the information out because we were doing concerts in every park in all boroughs and trying to get people crossover. And uh, it's just like, uh, even uh, when we went on with the uh, uh, Newport on the 20th anniversary, we gave them a list of demand to, uh, to give something back to the community, which they never got here to put in uh, the we were trying. Yes, but let me add something to that. I, I was living in Brooklyn during those times, and what's not Bedford Avenue, what's the name of the Oh, uh, Fulton, Fulton Street. There were, right around the corner from the Loop Curve and Claver Place where the East was, there were three other prominent jazz clubs. There was the Blue Coronet, uh, I forgot what the other one was across the street, down on the corner. There was the Brooklyn Baby Grand, right. you know. And I mean, these places were smoking. Max Roach was in and out of those places. All the prominent artists of that time, Brooklyn was really a very active jazz capital. You know, you know. I mean, people were coming from all over. You know, so, so it was a very important development, and and I think that. Uh, but your place outlasted all of those jazz clubs. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was Break the Way. George Break's right there. I mean, he was one of the longest last. Oh, see, now that's what I'm saying. After hours. I mean, see, there's yeah. so many things that people aren't aware of. Yeah. That musicians, you know, if you want to <coughs> play all night, you go to Break the Way. Club Muzart. Muzart. Well, yeah. but, uh, you know, I'm sorry, bro. The Muse and stuff. <laughs> Muzart. But, I mean, he was, he, he was there. People don't even recognize us. You know, there's those things. He was there before Artist House was on, on Prince Street, you know. And so there was just so many uh, activities. And not only they had the United Tribe down on, across from the pool, I mean, there were just so many places. They had places all over the place. I mean, Sam even was doing stuff with schools up here, you know. And they yeah, had, right. The Harlem Culture Center. I mean, there were so many people involved that were mutually supportive, not totally involved, because he could, you know, we say, can, can we do programs, uh, you know, under the, this umbrella, different places to drive. Do they still have the festival at boys, at the new boys and girls high school? Well, like I said, we moved to downtown Brooklyn. We were oh, in Commodore Barry Park. Right. After, right. They, yeah. after they renovated that, we weren't able to actually go ahead and get back onto the field. Uh, we had been on Fulton Street, but then that became too restrictive. So we ended up finding another park, which is Commodore Barry Park, which we started there in about uh, 2001, 2002, I guess it was. I remember it was on Clayton Place. Yeah, well that's the yeah. original. That was, that's when it was the African Street Carnival, as we call it first. That's the right. And then we, we expanded too far, and there was St. Peter Claver Church down there, so um, you know we, we kind of had an incentive to move out of the street into Boys and Girls High School, which we did, and you know, we stayed there for a number of years until they renovated that field. And well, and just briefly, I'm sorry, um, since this is a social discussion about music, I know Mr. Chauway, and then we'll lead into one, uh, because I know uh, all three of us 
more um, people have questions. Yes. People. people. Just briefly, you once told me a story about going to Slugs to see Cecil Taylor on the night Dr. King was assassinated, which seems like wow. it's a, Take that. when he had Frank Wright in the band, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. what was that experience like? Yeah. Um, you know, again, um, you know, this idea that this music is not like a uh, a European classical music. You know, uh, you know, it is something in terms of you know its creation that is connected to our lives. So, I was a student at NYU, '68, uh, and uh, you know we had heard about uh, Dr. King's assassination, and we were. Uh, organizing and preparing what we did the following day is we actually shut the school down for a while, uh, caused some damage, and out of that came uh, the Martin Luther King Scholarship Program, which had blacks, Latinos, and poor whites attending New York University with major, major scholarships. That happened in the fall of 1968. But the evening of April 4th, myself and some of my friends uh, we went down to Slugs, you know, we went across from Washington Square, you know, walked all the way east, and Cecil Taylor was performing. And, uh, you know, the atmosphere was just so heavy and tense. Uh, Cecil himself, I know he tore that piano up that night. Mm -hmm. That piano, after Cecil was finished with it, was no good. <laughs> and, uh, and Frank Wright, I mean, I remember clearly, like, he was playing, and at a particular point, it was like he was running in place as he played. And, I mean, the music was just uh, so expressive of the anger that everybody was feeling at the particular time. And it was just a way for that particular anger to be expressed in a creative and somewhat positive way. Please, go ahead. You're, you must be burning with questions. <laughs> well, I, I'm just loving this discussion because it dovetails into an idea that I've cooked up on my own, which is as a student of evolutionary biology, I have asked the question, what is the purpose of music and art? Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything's got to pay for itself. And for, it's all about survival. And the answer that I've come to is that the purpose of art, the purpose of music, is to create community. That is its purpose. It's not about entertainment. It's not about feeling good. It's about something bigger than that. And another kind of like classical music, Western classical music, which is I grew up on, and I was like the slave to these dots. You know, I'm going to make that dots. You know, and it was it was anything. I used to kick my piano. And um, Western classical music is imperial music. It was written to entertain the emperor and the emperor's lackeys. And so th this is the point I just want to ma make, is that if we understand that the pu purpose of art is community, the purpose of community is freedom within that community. There is no com community when you got an emperor. There is no community where there is an emperor. So what I want to propose is, is that musicians, when you learn how to play scales and all that other rest of that stuff, you should also be learning how to make community. That is the purpose. If you're making fabulous music at Lincoln Center and everybody's paying their money and they're going home just as depressed as when they went, you fail. I don't care how good your music is if you haven't made community. Okay. Yes, uh, the, uh, this is great because uh, I, this music was so important to me, this free jazz. I heard Farrell Saunders in 1961 when I was a freshman in college. That same semester I heard Leroy Jones, because that's what he was known at the time, reading uh, uh, Dante's Inferno in Newark. And for, for Someone like myself, who, who just couldn't, there was something about the United States that I, I just didn't dig. I didn't understand what the problem was. But when I heard people playing that kind of music, Farrell Saunders play, play and hearing uh, Leroy Jones' poems, 
I said, well, this was, this was something authentic. It was real. And it was totally different than anything I'd, I'd heard before. And so for me, black nationalism, black culture, was, was like a beacon. It was like the North Star leading me away from this, this conformist, materialist society. I went to hear Malcolm X in, in 1965 um, at uh, the Militant Forum. That was, I, I didn't know what the hell this was, these, these leaflets on the, on the seats about, uh, about the Cuban Revolution and everything, but I, 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 was, I just was thrilled to hear Malcolm. Uh, two years later, I was, I was involved with the Vietnam Anti-War when I joined the party that organized the event. Uh, this black, the music of Albert Eiler, music of, of, of the, what do they call the new thing back then? You have to see, it was, it was, it was, it was a black expression, but for people by, by myself, it was, it was, it was like a, a shining light. It was, it changed my life. It was super important to me, and that, that's why I just want to thank you for, for speaking today, because this is one of the best discussions I've ever heard at Left Forum, and I'm just thrilled to hear it. Thank you, Kat. Is, yeah. is it okay to have one more Q&A, and then we can all answer? Uh, Sorry, does anybody want to say anything about the Musicians Union? I beg your pardon? Does anyone want to say anything about the Musicians Union? Which? Uh, Ado, the, the musician yeah. even yeah. here. Uh, I'm, it, it, it's fine if you're in, in the club, because uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you'll 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 uh, be working. And uh, uh, I, I haven't paid my dues in uh, many years. But uh, previously, in order to get paid on on I do sessions and many gigs, I've had to go through the union. Fortunately, I don't have to anymore uh, at this time right now. But I uh, I uh, I think. I can't see how the union has served because uh, uh, people, because I know in the, in the 60s, we were trying to uh, establish an alternative union back in, the, in the, back in the 60s. So I haven't seen much change in terms of uh, uh, employment. I, I joined the Musicians Union in 14. Hmm. I've been there 17 years, all right? Now, when I first joined the union, uh, I was playing all kinds of various music, you know, and there were a lot of musics. Um, well, in Chicago, we had two different unions. When I got to New York, there was only one. You know? And the one in Chicago eventually amalgamated. But what that amalgamation enabled me to do was play Broadway shows and do other things that were exclusively not including black musicians, all right? I mean, in my lifetime, I saw that happen. And a whole lot of, you know, but, but I was working constantly, not just playing what you call improvised music, but, but all kinds of, because I went to school and I got a master's degree in that. So I was, I was able to do that. But times were changing and evolving all the time. And, and things have changed almost violently more dramatically over the last 20 years because so many new styles and the technological devices where people who you couldn't hear before now have lasting amplification. That, that, you know, you can't miss them. So, so all these things are affecting our world. You know, and some of us are able to ride on it. You know, I, I was fortunately able to avoid the dips too much and, and stay involved. But, but, you know, a lot of people aren't. And fortunately, some of us are still surviving. I just want to go back, and, and this gentleman here, he was talking about the different categories of uh, music. Uh, like you said, uh, drawing from the uh, African-American experience, I, I call that Afrocentric music, okay, and opposed to Eurocentric music. And there are different objectives, uh, because uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of my experience and dealing with different, I play with a group called Sankofa, we do village music, and it's not, uh, it's not necessarily, uh, I just did a concert yesterday, and what we do, just like you guys are here, we come in, it's not a performance, it's an involvement, everyone, everyone in here. If you, if you, if you don't play an instrument, hey, hey, you can jump up and clap, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can holler and say, Mbizile, anything, you say, hey, no, but express yourself, it's about expression, and all those energies, which you're talking about, only regenerate uh, the community, and it brings people together. They do it on all kinds of, for birth, to death, for celebrations, for harvest, and so, so these are, 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 are natural components 
that uh, this culture, the Eurocentric, is not built on that. I mean, you know, the king didn't hire us to, to uh, compose something, you know, or, you know, for, for his wife, uh, you know, whatever time she has, or dance, or whatever, you know. And so I'm saying that's, that's where, I, where I see the difference. And also the connection is with the, uh, uh, the root of uh, all the, uh, the, the blue spiritual avant-garde. It's basically to connect with the soul, not the notes. You know, because you can put the notes out there and, and write them, but if you're not connected with yourself in your expression, like they were talking about the expression, like they were saying that we were all were angry uh, during the 60s. Every time we get angry daily and we do things, but uh, uh, it was an expression. And uh, uh, during that period, it was heavy on, on expressing yourself. And it's just like he said, we used to go there uh, and, and play, play, play ride in the subway just to get that sound against opposed to where we live up there, our state of, of playing next to a creek and listening to the frogs and playing with, with the Katy Dids. You know what I mean? All these things are incorporated in sound. And so what happens is that with the musician that I know, it's, a, it's, a, it's in your bank and you're expressing these things, how you dig up. And if, if you're not coming from true creation from vibration, you're, you, hey, it's, just, it's like a plumber. You, you go to school, you learn something, you can do it. But uh, you know you could do it with with the craftsmanship. Our art artists a creative element, and you know the difference when the creative spirit is flowing. And without the connection with the people, uh, you're just up there. You know what I mean? You might be doing your best, and it may be perceived or not, but you're not concerned with that because you're. You know. So that's the difference between that I find between uh, 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 Eurocentric and Afrocentric music is that the Eurocentric is the stuck to the paper time, whatever March, whatever Beethoven, any, anybody. And, and you're stuck in that structure, and they feel that you can give the expression of the artist a thousand years previously. You can't. You know, I, play, I, I see guys play, I play with a lot of uh, Hendrix all around the world. Hendrix stuff, can't nobody do, hey, you know what I mean? You know, and they do all these cover tunes, but they don't realize that, that Hendrix, the expression was on stepping stone. Hey, you know what I mean? It was like, you hear it, and you take a piece of it, like the ideas, and, and move on. You know? and, and, that's yes, and, is, is and we it. all have our own rhythm. Thank you. I mean, uh, all of us have our own each one. And that reminds me, music, what Mr. Smith and Mr. Sultan just said, music as a functional thing, which reminds me of all theater studies in Africa, who's not only a co-moderator, but a great musician as well, who plays the chorus. And I just wanted to ask her to tie that all in because you were right in the yeah. whole of the concept of music as functional tie it all to in. everyday um, life. Yeah, so you know, I, uh, you know, my father's a free jazzer, and I grew up with the stuff. And um, you know, we, it, it's interesting because I feel like a lot of my musical education was the opposite direction. For most people, you hear some classical music when you're starting to learn, and if you're lucky, you get down to free jazz <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum. Mine was the other way. It was starting with the free jazz. And then I was like, oh, there's this stuff that people just do robotically. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was very lucky in that sense. But you know, I you know, I mean in the sense that yeah, I was five years old, my dad put me in Fred Ho's opera, this sort of thing, but that was like a dad's Bill Cole. Yeah, a dad's Bill Cole. Um so so yeah, but I, you know, so I started singing, I started learning piano, guitar, um, I studied guitar at conservatory and played the flamenco group for a while, and um, I do think there is something inherently uh, antisocial about the way that, the ways that we're teaching music, the ways that we're expecting children to excel with music. Um, I think that is really antithetical to the ways in which music, and frankly the most popular forms of music um, around the world have been produced and have been brought to life, right? And um, it's, it was a really challenging thing for me. Uh, the reason why I play core, why that's become my primary instrument, is that in 2011 I traveled, met an incredibly generous person who saw my, my real enthusiasm and energy for, for this instrument and just invested. <laughs> I mean, he basically, the first few months I was there, you know, he, he would spend whole days with me. And then uh, I came back because I, I decided that's when it, that's what that was the place I was happiest making music, um, and uh, I, when I got there, I had some money saved up, and I I was looking for jobs and things like this, and I missed a week of studying with him, and he calls me and he goes, where where are you? Like, and I said, you know, 
kind of in a bit of a dicey situation. You know, I've got this savings. I don't know how long it would be here, and I'm trying to see if I can get a job. And so, you know, I don't want to go if I can't pay you. You know, he's like, just show up. And from that moment, never asked me for any money. Um, and so for I studied with him for years and spent whole days in his house. I mean, I had this one moment where I was watching the local wrestling match with his family on TV, and I just felt so at home. And and that's why that's my primary instrument is because that's what feels best for me to play. That's where I've been taught how to be social with music. How, you know, I can play things so much faster on Quora than I can on guitar, um, which I have classical training on, right? Um, so I think there is, and there are such, I mean, the fascinating thing to me about African music is that that is very much the face of African culture. People really truly believe this is in African rhythm, is in African blood. And I'm not saying it's not, but I don't think it's not in anybody's blood, right? I think there's a reason why it resonates so deeply with so many people. And I think it is that social, really humanist element of it. Um, and so when we when we lose spaces, and the only spaces we have left are things like Alice Tully Hall and things like Broadway theaters and all of this, we're really, it, you know, there is something anti-humanist about that. Um, and I think it is something to, to consider. I don't know if I tied everything together, but I tried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just want to, I, Thank you all for this. It has tied something together for me. And there was a constant back and forth connection from, I was one of the original teachers at IS-201. Wow. So I had that, that connection. Um, I knew John Coltrane. He lived near my parents out in Huntington, Long Island. And, and uh, somebody, you mentioned Westbury? Uh, Sony Westbury. Sony Westbury. Westbury. I, uh, Train must have played more at a place called the Cork and Bib on Post Road in Westbury, where I saw him almost every night in the early 60s. Um, but my musical, direct musical experience has always been with Pete Seeger. And you talk about socializing music. Pete constantly spoke about and demonstrated that he would just as soon, and he, and he was genuine, he meant it, would just as soon never have been in Carnegie Hall in his life if he could spend all the time in schools with kids. And, and his whole thing was about getting audiences to join him and to participate. I once asked him, not long before he died, I once asked him, Pete, how would you most like to be known? What one word? And almost immediately he said, participant. Uh, wow. And I said, mm -hmm. I would have thought you said something like humanist. Or he said, no, participant. He said, we are all participants Amen. and we all have it in us to do this. So, so what you guys have been talking about ties all of this together. What I used to hear from Train, what I used to get from Seeger. Um, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, um, I, I had the opportunity to attend the concert this afternoon, uh, as well as um, having a little understanding of uh, the music that uh, in South America and Central America, we had the Afro Central America. And um, one of the things that, that, that I always said is that African music is interconnected with Indian music from the Andes. And, and because uh, the Indian music has, for instance, marimba, which or xylophone that you call it, mm -hmm. which is African. And we have uh, so many instruments that have come from Africa. And then <coughs> we have that, that uh, connection with Africa instead of the of musical. And beside which, um, um, I, I always, it's always, everybody expresses this common expression that music it has uh, all kind of languages. The, the lang the music is the universal language of the, everybody. So I think one of the things that how you were connected me was um, by mentioning this universal language and which brings all these connections with uh, Asia, uh, Africa, uh, and here to 
uh, the music how progress, but um, then um, we need to be doing this in, in communities. You are yeah. saying, right? Yeah. But then uh, I don't know of whether now the development of the internet will be considering uh, since they, we have the social media that uh, the internet will be that that new space that we need. What do you think? Person to person, no, no internet. I think that the thing is, if you get 20 people that, off to the side and able to deal with your music, I, I rather I rather do any live session with this than to, than to be on TV or the internet or any other thing. Personally, I'm selling it because see the it's an interpersonal connection. It's just like we're talking here, we're having a conversation. The same is with the music. If you put it on the internet, yeah, people enjoy it, and I'm entertained, and it's gone. Just like, just like we live in. See, it's, it's, it's more, to me, on an unnatural level. And I'm trying to get us back to a natural level through my music and through my way of life. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Excellent. Music is life. Yeah. We all have our own rhythm. We walk in the rhythm. Music is life. Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, but, but, but as you were pointing out before, in my in my generation, I grew up in rock and roll, and we had jazz. People wanted to block, but we disdained. Kids, we didn't like jazz. I got this that comedy now, hip hop, and all music. But fast forward to James Brown. When I first heard Super Bad and the guy named was McCullough, I'm listening to Jimi Hendrix at the time, which you played with. And I'm listening to this jazz solo, and I'm going like, what the hell is that? <laughs> this? And, and, and me and my friends, we're going like, what the hell? And then he's going like, blow me some train, blow me some train. And we're going like, and we, I, it blew our friggin' minds. And then yes. from that, I got into to, to get, um, um, uh, Miles Davis, and we started doing fusion, right. bitches brew, and we did right. on the corner, and we, and so we got in. We they got the fusion. That was creative. Okay, it was. Yeah, that's, that's legit. <laughs> but so we got so as my generation, we were into P funk, but we got into jazz too. I don't see that happening anymore. These kids today don't know. Like when I was growing up, I knew about jazz. Knew about jazz musicians. Started to learn about jazz. But I, today, everything has just changed. And internet. <laughs> well, well, see, with the, the, today, uh, there, there, there are many talented young people out there, but but so many people are are, are not going. Uh, they're caught up. They're caught up in in the American way. Money. Okay, which is to me, I was going to go there uh, uh, in terms of capitalism, exploitation, and all, all the rest of it. But they're caught up in the hype, and so like the music that you're listening to, you you, you listen to some of the hip hop. Uh, they can't play a note, but they can sure sample with the technology. Mm -hmm. So and and, and so the separation. I, I I deal with recordings. I hate overdubbing, but I, I'm I'm a perfect click track guy. He'll tell you, I don't need a click track. You just tell me where the rhythm is, and I can stick to the time for hours. But I'm just trying to say, but the the music that they're doing right now is all mechanized. Everything, whatever you do when you go in the studio, cats will run a, 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 a click track or. Or something. Do you understand? It's, it's, it's all mechanized. And then if it's not good enough, they'll take it in, in the end and take your thing on a waveform and move it. Mm -hmm. You understand? Right. So what what they do with productions and all of it, mm -hmm. they take. If there is any life in what you're playing, to me, they suck it out. Mm -hmm. And this is why I said I would rather play for a live audience of one if they're in the bathroom than than to record. But I wouldn't, just, I mean, I, 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 please, one, I don't want to hold you up, I really want to hear what you have to say, but as a, a youngin, um, <laughs> I, 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 I would like to say don't be cynical, because I do think, I would say in the same ways that jazz feels inaccessible to many people, actually those kids who are really interested in that, they're not the forefront mm -hmm. of the generation, absolutely, but at the same time, you know, like at Columbia University, the most the class that always fills up and can't get a spot is jazz history. Mm -hmm. That's a class of 400 students. Um, Billy Harper's classes at New School are the most heavily demanded. Um, and that's where you've got Robert Glasper, that's where you, you know, have people doing mechanized things, but being really inspired. And I, you know, I was talking with a friend the other day with 
who is also a music nerd, with two non-music nerds, and they were asking us about jazz, and like, oh, well, is this jazz? And we're like, it's all jazz. <laughs> all the music. <laughs> there, it's, you know, and so I do think that, you know, if you're listening to any music right now, the influence is there, the connection is there. It's not that far from me to inspire people. And I think it's it's the sense of, oh, you're not doing it, the pushback on that, that actually kids may feel not to identify with that, but, you know, I don't think there really are very many people in this generation who truly aren't interested in jazz. I think it is there. We have to also talk about the role of record companies and what they've Commercial done to mainstream. actually yeah. Give us the lowest common denominator in regards to hip hop, yeah. because there have been positive hip hop groups, as you know, that have not been actually going ahead and promoted in the way that they should. On the other hand, you know, we've had fake gangsters and wannabe thugs present themselves as being gangsters when, in fact, they went to private school or wherever they went. All right, but. The record companies went ahead and told them that's the way you can make some money. And they projected this image, and that's what we end up with. Before you can say something. I was going to say, please go hear live music. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. 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 Thank I agree with Fia's, I mean, I want to back over to this point because I feel like, you know, you can't really talk about today, we're talking about like Kendrick Lamar, you know, Kamazi Washington, um, you know, even back in my day, Stetisonic, talking about jazz, you know, the roots, you know, all these groups are implementing like jazz sounds in their music, and, um, and I think that's very important. But also I think that it's also that the music is going on today and it's still political. So you got like Ross Mache's Music Now series at the Commons, you have like, Sisters place, like there are places where the music is like living and being and like like organic and I think it's important for us to nurture like for more like Mr. Smith says to nourish that. So that's I think that's also important. Another thing too, I think it's also you know, um 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 Garcia had mentioned um, the record companies. I mean one thing I, I came in late, but I think it's also important to think about like the role of critics, you know, and like all this music that you're talking about was written about. And I think that, you know, I think part, part, part of it is just the it's connection. And, you know, obviously Lawrence Neo, Amir Baraka, um, these folks who are writing about the music, um, I think that's e equally as important as anything else um, in terms of thinking about this in terms of like, you know, as a, as a part of a larger collective struggle. But I also want to say this is this is like one of the best panels I've been to the left form. And, uh, I've, I've been to a lot of panels this weekend, so thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I wanted to say, you know, about when you say bringing in the hip-hop and things. I, I had friends who actually worked with New Edition, a friend who was the musical director. And he thought it was just something that was just going to blow away. You know, he said, oh, I'll do this thing, you know, this is going to go away, I'm not going to have to worry about it. Later on, I had another friend who's a musician who had to come into Bobby Brown's to lay down some music for something that Bobby Brown, and Bobby Brown walks in high as a kite. I'm gonna say it straight out. And he goes, is this how you did it in the old days? Why can't we just sample something? See, and this is where I feel you start losing music. Because, you know, you could say that there's people that are interested, but I've seen, you know, artists who have no idea of what it takes to put music together of what a musician does, of, of the time that it takes to really put music together. Because all they're doing is sitting there with a computer. And they think if they take a computer and they put this and this and this together, that it's music. Yeah. Okay, there's some people that say it's an art form. Okay, I'll take art form, but I don't think it's music. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd love to comment on that quickly on, on sampling culture and of course it's so tied to jazz and I, I really really hear what you're saying I think it's a really important point I used to work at the Alan Lomax archives and I'd have all my young friends who are using stuff from the archives that is digitized it's available online you know if you want to use it it's not that difficult to figure out and they come to me and they say you know what can I do can I help in some way and be really interested and I get into well I've got a 15 point plan I get past point two and they're gone <laughs> you know and I think that's the thing is that the interest is there 
people he hear the music, it resonates with them, it's not that they're not interested in jazz, it's how to pull that thread into a direction that's self-determined, into a direction that's tied into community and community building. That's a real challenge and a real question. But I think we, but the, but the point is that if they're using it, if they want to use it, the interest is there, and the love is there, and the love is there, right? So, yeah, I think. Thank you.